This video will introduce you to fundamental limit laws, which allow you to evaluate complicated limits in terms of simpler limits. We'll start with the most fundamental limit laws. The most basic kind of function you can have is a constant function, where the value is simply the same constant number k. The graph would be a horizontal line. All function values are equal to k, so it should come as no surprise that as an argument x approaches a, the function value, which is after all simply k, is going to approach k. And so our first limit law is limit as x approaches a of k is simply k. The identity function is not much more complicated. It's given by the formula f of x equals x. So if we want to examine the limit of this function as x approaches a, we'll notice that the value of the function is just x. So as x approaches a, the value x approaches a. And so we have our second limit law. Let's remember what it means to scale a function. So if you have a function f, and you multiply by a constant k, you're going to stretch the graph in some way away from the x-axis. This factor, we'll call it a scaling factor or simply a scalar. And depending on whether k is small or large or positive or negative, you'll get different effects. If the absolute value of k is greater than 1, then the graph will be stretched away from the x-axis. So for example, here's a picture of what happens when k equals 3. If the absolute value of k is less than 1, then you get a compression towards the x-axis. Here's the case where k equals a half. All the function values have been cut in half, basically. When k is negative, you also get a flip. The most basic case here is when k equals negative 1, and you get a pure flip with no stretching or compression. So in this picture, we have a function f on the left, and then the scaled function k times f on the right. And we'll assume that the limiting value as x approaches a on the left is some number l. And what we want to do is try to figure out what the new limit is going to be as x approaches a for the function on the right. The key is to imagine that if the limiting value is determined by nearby function values, and these function values are all being scaled by the same factor k, it stands to reason that this limiting value also sort of comes along for the ride, and the new limit is also scaled by the same factor k. So the punchline is the limit as x approaches a of k times f of x is simply k times L, the limit as x approaches a of f of x. And this is still true when k is negative. When you scale by a negative number, the graph flips, so this limit you're looking for will be the opposite sign of the original, but that's okay because k is negative, so kL will also be negative, and it flips as well. So the, the bottom line here is you don't have to do anything funny when k is negative. This one rule applies whether k is positive or negative. In fact, it's even true when k is 0. And the easiest way to imagine this is 0 times f of x is the constant function 0. So the limit's definitely 0. And of course, 0 times the limit is also 0. Both sides of this equation are 0. So it's true in the simplest sort of way. So we have a scaling law for limits. If the limit as x approaches a of f of x exists and is finite, then the limit of k times f is k times the limit. Or what we could say is the limit of a scalar multiple is the multiple of the limit. Let's turn to the sum of two functions. So here we have functions f and g, and we want to add these. The way you add two functions is you add their corresponding values at each argument. This has graphical implications, so if you take the y-coordinate of each point on the graph to be an instruction as to how far away from the x-axis you should move, then you can imagine the values as these arrows, arrows pointing down 
correspond to negative numbers. And when you want to graph the sum, you take the instructions from one of these functions and the instructions from the other function and you add them together. And the net result tells you where the points of the graph of f plus g lie. And we might call this idea graphical addition. Suppose we're interested in examining the limiting value of the sum of two functions. Suppose the limiting value of f of x as x approaches a is k, and the limiting value of g of x as x approaches a is l. And now we want to find the limiting value as x approaches a of the sum. We observe that the number k, the limiting value, is the limit of nearby function values. And similarly, this limiting value is the limiting value of nearby function values. What's this limit of the sum? The y-coordinate is determined by nearby function values. But those nearby function values obey the graphical addition law. It makes sense to imagine that this limiting value also comes along for the ride like a bubble on a wave. It's being carried by the graphical addition rules nearby. So the limit we're looking for is the sum of the two limits. It's k plus l. If you think that's obvious, then you should take a look at this. This is the official rigorous proof using the technical definition of limit. It's a surprising amount of work to derive a proof for what seems to be such a simple result. And what this reflects is how subtle limits turn out to be. As mentioned previously, a, a deep understanding of calculus requires you to deal with this technical definition of limit. Our goal is not to go that route, but we will provide as much rigor and proof as seems reasonable. But this will probably be the last time we take a glimpse at the epsilon delta technical definition of limits. Let's take stock of the limit laws we've examined so far. We have limit laws for the fundamental constant functions and the identity function, and we have limit laws for dealing with scalar multiples of functions and sums of functions. Let's try to apply these laws to a couple of problems now. Let's evaluate the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x plus 5. First thing we'll do is break this apart using the sum law. The factor of 3 can come out using the scalar law. The identity law tells us this limit is just 2. And the constant law tells us this limit is obviously 5. Putting all the pieces together, we find that the limiting value of 3x plus 5 as x approaches 2 is 11. Assuming the limits of f and g as x approaches a both exist and are finite, prove the difference law for limits. In other words, the limit of a difference is the difference of the limits. This looks like it's possibly a new law that would require some sort of fancy geometric proof. But actually, let's get leverage from the tools we've already developed. The key to this is the simple observation that the difference of two things is simply the sum of the first thing plus negative 1 times the second thing. Now we can apply the sum law to break this limit up into the sum of two limits. And we can apply the scalar law to pull out the factor of negative 1, apply our simple algebraic observation, and there is the difference of the limits. Before we end, we're going to examine one more critical law of limits, and that is a product law for limits. Our question is this. If we know the limiting values of functions f and g as x approaches a, what is the limiting value of the product f of x times g of x as x approaches a? At this point, it seems reasonable to expect that the product of the limit is equal to the limit of the products. What we'd like to do is to construct a geometric argument that makes this result plausible. The nature of this proof requires us to approach A from only one side. Let's just approach from the left side. 
We're going to flip this graph and turn it around and move it into position so that we have access to some space here that we're going to need. The key to this proof is to represent the product of the values somehow. What we'll do is use the function values themselves as the length and width of rectangles and the product will be the area of the corresponding rectangle. Now we're going to watch what happens as x gets closer to a. We're going to get new rectangles each time. And the question is, what is the limiting value of the areas of these rectangles? The sides, the height and the base, those values are approaching the limiting values of f and g separately. And so it seems reasonable to imagine that the areas which represent f of x times g of x, those areas seem to be getting closer to the product of the limits of f and g independently, which are those sides of that rectangle that's pictured. So we have one more law of limits for products of functions, which we can think of as the limit of a product is the product of the limits.